One of the phenomena that have taken our world by storm are these social justice movements where those who have experienced oppression, those who have experienced prejudice, have sort of found their voice and risen up to, to, uh, to resist the said oppression. One of those movements is known as the Me Too movement, and essentially what that was, was uh, la ladies in particular, female gender, who have been oppressed or taken advantage of in the workplace, particularly the entertainment industry, but where people, and usually men of position and of power and of ability to promote careers, have used that position of power and of trust and opportunity to obtain sexual favors and to put women in a position where they are used and abused for their bodies and for sexual pleasure. There's another one that's taken our world by storm in the last little while, and that's called Black Lives Matter. And it's this idea that certain people in positions of trust, certain people who have historically had privilege and so on, are, use their positions of power to oppress and to repress those who are of a different uh, ethnic background or of, are of a mini minority in a society. The Black Lives Matter movement, one of the most striking images to me that I recall seeing there is of a clash of a protest uh, in England where a, a white man on the opposite side of the Black Lives Matter protest was there protesting their protesting, if you like, got himself into trouble in the clash between the crowds and found himself on the ground being trampled. And the remarkable image that came out of that was of this black man who went to the aid and to rescue the white man who was protesting protesting against him, right, saw that he was in trouble, picked him up and carried him out of that angry crowd and to a place of safety. Our world is a place of power imbalance. Our world is a place where power and position are often exploited, not to serve those who might need that serving, but rather to consolidate the person in power's strength or to, to obtain what they want from a selfish agenda perspective. We live in a world where selfish, carnal hearts will use position, will use power, will use privilege, will use religion, will use whatever is within their grasp, whatever gives them a position higher up and a, an influence over others, instead of to bless and to serve, rather to serve oneself. That is one of the tragedies of this world, that it leads to untold hurt. It leads to generations of injustice, of anger, of frustration, eventually of uprising and of overturning those institutions and those positions of power. And especially in the context of perhaps law enforcement or in the context of religion, where there's supposed to be this sense of altruistic, disinterested in self, commitment to others, to their well-being, to serve, to protect, to bless, uh, and then to find that those positions have been used in essence to, 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 to lord over, we find it particularly heinous and particularly damaging. Because when those who have experienced that pain and that suffering come out the other side of that, they're often scarred for life. It sets people up for cycles that then perpetuate themselves from generation to generation to generation. But you know, this prejudice, this uh, selfish use of power, this even religious neglect or worse yet, religious fraud perpetrated in our world today is not an uncommon thing. This is not the first generation these things have happened. This is endemic to a world that is, is infiltrated by sin. In the time of Jesus, he came into a society, he came into a time and a place where these things existed within Judaism, where they existed within the Roman rule over Judaism in the Promised Land. They lived, uh, it lived in, in, in the form of racial prejudice between Jew and Samaritan or whatever other people group existed. You see, the things we're experiencing today and the things we protest against today and the things that we rightfully raise our voice to condemn today are not new to this day and to this age. As long as there has been sin, there have been these problems. As long as there have been selfish hearts, there have been these problems. It's not a white thing. It's not a black thing. It's a sin thing. It is the way in which we will use our whatever opportunities and whatever advantages we have instead of to serve others, to serve ourself. So Jesus told a story. It's a well-known story that you will have heard a thousand times over. You don't even have to be religious to know the story, but it's called the Good Samaritan. 
And it's called this because it's the story of how a Samaritan man comes to the rescue of a Jewish man. Now, I just want to step back a, a step or two because it's important that you understand the context here. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. They did not like each other in the smallest little bit. The Jews saw the Samaritans as the syncretistic blend of the true worship of Jehovah with, this, with the idolatry of the surrounding nations. So it was one thing for a Jew to not like a Gentile who was the worshiper of a false god, but someone who was somewhere in the middle, had Jewish blood in them, and who had some semblance of, of adopting the Jewish religion, but then who mixed that with all that other stuff, it created this murky ground in the middle that was more reprehensible in their minds than if somebody was just out there having nothing to do with them of a completely different nature and a completely different breed and a completely different religion. And so there was this tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. I mean, one story that comes to mind is when Jesus is not welcomed in to Samaria by the Samaritans and James and John, known as the, thuns of, as the sons of thunder, in the New Testament, disciples of Jesus, on the journey with Jesus, supposed to be learning of Jesus, become indignant, become outraged, and they say to Jesus, shall we bring down fire upon Samaria and consume them for the slight and the insult that they've showed you? Or remember the time when Jesus came to the well of Samaria and there he met the Samaritan woman. The story is told in John chapter 4. She is surprised that he being a Jew would even speak to her to ask for a drink of water. And the gospel writer, John, right, who we're just talking about, the son of thunder, later on when he writes the gospel account, now completely changed and transformed, known as the disciple of love, makes the point of saying that the reason she said this is because the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And then there was that other time in John chapter 8 where, where Jesus was insulted by the religious leaders. He had done some things, said some things that offended their sensibilities. And like the worst form of insult that they could say against him, knowing that he was a thoroughbred Jewish man coming you know, from the towns of Judah, of Judea, they said to him, Do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and that you have a demon? They called him demon-possessed and a Samaritan. Like those two are pretty close to each other, you know, in the Jewish mindset. I mentioned these case studies and these cases in point because you must understand the impact that this story would have upon the hearers of Jesus' day. To us, it's simply a story of a guy who did good to his neighbor. But in their day, this was completely upside down. It was completely unheard of. The Jews have nothing to do with the Samaritans. The Samar Samaritans have nothing to do with the Jews. I mean, I'm sure we could think of other racial situations of tension like that. Think of the worst, the worst conflict between nations or tribes or people groups and then transpose the story into that context. That's what it would have been like for the people of Jesus' day. Now, here's the other interesting thing about this story. It was actually a genuine historical event. It was still fresh in the minds of the people that he was telling the story to. In other words, what Jesus did in this parable was take a real historical occurrence and turn it to teach a spiritual lesson. It would be like you and I taking something out of the news and then turning it into a spiritual object lesson, right? So that's what Jesus is doing here. And the context in which this happens is a dispute. It says here in Luke chapter 10, and we're looking here at verse 25, it says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? He answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? You see, what's going on in the story is that a Jewish man who's called a lawyer comes to Jesus to trap him in a question of law. Now, a Jewish man who is a lawyer is not dealing with the secular law of the Roman state. A Jewish lawyer is someone who is a specialist in the Old Testament books of Moses. That's what, that's what the Jewish law was. So this is essentially a theologian. This is essentially a biblical teacher and a biblical scholar coming to Jesus to challenge him on a spiritual point of understanding. 
and it, it ends up being about eternal life, which is answered by the law of God, which is then answered by another question of who is my neighbor. The man is happy to accept, in fact, he's the one who gives the answer because Jesus turns this whole thing around on him and says, well, you tell me what does the law say? Which is the greatest commandment in the law, in essence, is a similar question to this. And he says he doesn't go to any of the ceremonial laws. He doesn't go to any of the things that make the Jews uniquely Jewish. He's obviously a man who has been studying the word of God and he sees the dry formalism of the Pharisees as being bankrupt. So when Jesus turns the question back on him about eternal life, he says, it's about relationship. It's not about ceremony. It's not about ritual. It's not about uh, religious liturgy or anything like that. It's not about the external forms of religion or a checkpoint list of behaviors. He goes straight to the heart of it. It is about relationship. What is eternal life? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And the next one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is the one that trips the man up because it says there in the Bible, in order to justify himself, he asks an obfuscating question. He asks a question that's meant to take the limelight off of what it means to love your neighbor. He's quite content within himself that he loves the Lord his God with all his heart, with all his mind. But when it comes to loving mankind, that's a little bit different because this question of who is your neighbor and so therefore what is the requirement or rather the limitation of this law to love your neighbor? You know, it only says love your neighbor, so clearly it can't be your enemies, right? Clearly it can't be the Samaritans, right? Clearly it can't be those unclean Gentiles, right? Clearly it can't be tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and all that nasty immoral type of stuff, right? I mean, to love your neighbor must mean to love those who are very much like you. To love those who are of the right frame of mind, of the right spiritual orientation. Be kind to the household of God, if you like. That's what to love your neighbor must mean, right? That was the debate that raged. And so he turns this question to justify himself, to, to take the limelight off of himself, to, to deny the deep claim of the law that's sort of beginning to center upon his heart, sink down upon him. He's like, yes, but we all know that neighbor has a very contracted meaning. And that is when Jesus tells them this story. A man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's some 25 kilometers away. This is a serious journey, right? No cars, no trains, by foot, on a donkey maybe, or some animal of burden, right? It's going to be a full day's journey. And so this idea that this man is going from Jerusalem to Jericho, don't miss that detail, from Jerusalem to Jericho, away from the holy city, away from the temple. And the reason that detail is important because this man who's traveling this road goes down through a rocky ravine, this mountain pass, if you like, a place where there's lots of hiding places, and it was a place known for highway robbery. It was a place where thieves and robbers often hid because it was soft targets that walked through there. And sure enough, this Jewish man headed away from Jerusalem to Jericho is attacked. The thieves not only take him stuff, but they beat him, they bloody him, they leave him for dead. He's going to die of his injuries of starvation or of, of, of dehydration, of blood loss, if, if he's left there in that condition. The story continues to unfold with a priest first. A priest who is also going from Jerusalem to Jericho. In other words, the priest has finished his temple duties. Because if he was still engaged in his temple duties, requiring ceremonial cleanness and the like, he would still be in Jerusalem. But he's leaving Jerusalem going home. And so as he goes down through there, he comes upon his countrymen. He comes upon one of his own flesh, of his own blood, of his own religion, of his own nationality. This man is surely his neighbor by even the most contracted definition of the word neighbor. Surely the priest, this religious man, this example in religious things and spirituality, right? Surely he would have compassion. I mean, he's just come from Jerusalem. He's just come from service in the temple. I mean, surely if you're busy with the rounds of ceremony that point your mind toward God, that open your heart to his salvation, that make you aware of his grace and his kindness, and you're filled with this gratitude of heart, surely this man who is of like blood, of like nationality, of like religion, definitely his neighbor, touched by the grace of God, surely he would have compassion on this, on this poor specimen of humanity dying on the side of the road. But unfortunately, he didn't. 
the story unfolds with a second opportunity. This time it's a Levite. Not a priest, but a Levite. In other words, someone of the house of Levi involved in the temple services, devoted to holy things, spirituality and religion, just like the priests. The Levites did other duties in the temple while the priests mediated the sacrifices and the like. They're both working in that same environment. They're both supposed to be in the very house of God, in the place where their hearts are touched by the grace of God, where they minister the grace of God in behalf of others, right? I mean, this is the irony of the story. These are religious, spiritual men involved in missionary service, in the service of humanity, in the very presence of God, in the place of God's Shekinah glory where it's manifested, involved in the, the very rituals that remind us of the grace of the kindness of God. And yet, for all their supposed spirituality, for all their religiosity, the irony in the story is it becomes clear in the way they show disdain and neglect for their fellow human being, how they will not rescue him in his time of need, how they're willing to leave him there to die of his wounds or of dehydration or whatever else it might be, right? They're willing to pass by this man for the fear of their inconvenience, maybe because they reason that their time of service is done in the temple and now is their time of rest. They don't want to be interrupted. They don't want to be spiritually or at least ceremonially defiled by coming into contact with, with blood and the like, which would make them ceremonially unclean. They, they, they justify, they even use their religious purity as a justification to pass by the needs of humanity. I mean, this is the strange irony here. Listen to me carefully. You cannot come into contact with divinity without coming into contact with humanity. What do I mean by that? I mean, Jesus is our example. When divinity and humanity were div united in Jesus, he became the servant of the Most High as the one who knew the heart of God, who came from the presence of God. He came into this world to seek and to save the lost. He came to, to, to minister to those in need. He came to show compassion at great personal cost. He came to be defiled by us and our record of sin. He came to lay down his life. This is true religion. That is true spirituality. The heart of the divine in Christ made him reach out to touch humanity. You and I, if we are really walking with God, you and I, if we're really in touch with God, above and beyond our profession, above and beyond our, our masquerading of spiritual things and our quoting of scripture and our engaging in religious service and our dropping of tithes and offerings and, 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 and doing these obvious, outwardly visible things, the real evidence, the real evidence that our spirituality is genuine, that we have the, the real deal with God, is that if our hearts have come into contact with divinity, they will also reach out for contact with humanity. We are willing to be bloodied and bruised. We are willing to take risk by helping this man. What if those robbers and those thieves are still there? What if they're, gonna, what if they're waiting for their next victim? We're not concerned about our ceremonial purity. We're not concerned about our spirituality. We're not concerned about whether we're going to suffer harm. If we have been touched by the grace of God and we have come into contact with the divine, the influence, the power, and the reshaping, the transforming of the divine upon our hearts will manifest itself in making us compassionate, kind, and merciful to our fellow human beings. There will be no caste you know, higher and lower in our minds, as there is no caste in the mind of God. There will be no black and there will be no white in our minds, as there is no black and white in the mind of God. There will be no cultural superiority, linguistic pride. There will be no any of that stuff that makes us unique compared to other people, but which we then transpose from uniqueness to superiority will be laid in the dust because we are all one family. We are all gods by creation. We are all Christ's by redemption. We belong to one creator and one redeemer. We are of one family by creation and we are one family by redemption. And we are all in this thing together because that man lying on the ground, that is you and that is me, spiritually speaking. And the good Samaritan who's about to show up on the scene of action in our story, that is is Jesus Christ. He 
picks us up in our lowest point, at the place where we were on the verge of death. He raises us up. He carries us himself to a place of sanctuary, to a place of rest, where the work of restoration and healing he does in our hearts. You see, when you realize that we are the broken in the story and that we have been saved by Jesus, you realize that anybody else you come across in the journey of life, that is that man broken and bleeding and suffering and dying, whether spiritually or physical, you realize that you are seeing yourself in that person. And all the barriers we throw up, color distinctions and cultural differences and all that stuff that adds flavor and uniqueness to the, to the human race, which is supposed to be a celebration of variety. We, our sinful, pride-filled, hate-filled hearts, carnal hearts, we hijack that uniqueness and that beauty that God has created, that rainbow of color through the human race. We hijack that and we make it points of difference that make us better than others. That, my friend, is satanic. That, my friend, is nothing of the kingdom of God. That, my friend, is rebuked by the example of Jesus and in the telling of this historically accurate story used as a spiritual object lesson. So as I've already hinted, the next and the third person to arrive on the scene of action here is none other than the Samaritan. A man who is completely distinct, different, religiously, nationally, and even this history of hatred, right? This, this man who is, who is just, no one would have guessed what is about to happen. I mean, if anything, this is the opportunity for the Samaritan to laugh, to spit, to kick a man while he's down, maybe even to finish him off. That's what should have happened if, if this was a predictable story. But instead, the Samaritan binds up his wounds, gives him water to drink, puts him on his donkey, walks him the rest of the journey to Jericho, puts him up in a hotel, pays for the innkeeper to care for him and to house him for a duration beyond which the man, the Samaritan, is able to stay there for. He uses his own expense. His compassion is awakened. He sees past difference. And he ministers to this individual to save his life and to restore him. As I say, that is the story of you and me being rescued by Jesus. This was the Samaritan showing compassion to a man who didn't deserve it. And an undeserving Jewish nation realizing, being rebuked by the kindness of the stranger. Like I mentioned earlier on, this picture that stuck in my mind of a man, a black man in this, in this whole uh, Black Lives Matter protesting thing, two sides, line drawn but in the middle, a, a white man protesting against the black man, the black man protesting against the white man. But when it came down to it and the white man got into trouble, this black man comes in and rescues him, picks him up and carries him to safety. A man who was on the opposite side of the fence to him. How many wars have been fought in history over religious issues, over religious difference? What kind of a nonsense is that? How many times have people used their political power or their position of privilege to lord it over others? What kind of a nonsense is that? We are one family. And anything you have and anything that I have, whether it is money, whether it is position, whether it is, whether it is the culture in which we live that favors us over others, whatever it is that we have that might advantage us is a gift by God to be used to restore, to bless, to serve humanity. That's the story of Jesus coming into this world, leaving the throne of heaven, bringing to us the advantage of divine power, bringing to us the, the advantage of divine revelation, bringing to us the very advantage of the presence of divinity, God himself in human flesh. And did he use those advantages to his own ends? Not once. Not once. Did he save his own life on the cross? No. But he resurrected numerous others who had died. Did he heal his own wounds? No, not once. But he certainly did heal the wounds and the sickness of others. Did, was, he, was he a person walking around displaying and using his power to, to solve his own hunger and thirst issues? No, not once. But he fed the multitudes. 
You see, the life of the kingdom that Jesus is illustrating here, the calling upon me and a calling upon you, is that we would be like our master, that we would be counter-cultural, because the cultures of this world are saturated. The expectations of this world are saturated. The ambitions of this world are saturated with the selfishness and the self-interest of sinful, carnal hearts. You and I are called to more than that. We are called to lay that pride in the dust. You know what? You know what the sanctification of the human heart by the working of the Holy Spirit is? When our hearts are being changed and transformed by the working of the Holy Spirit, the genuine article of spirituality, not just religious externals, you know what the sanctification of the human heart by the working of the Holy Spirit is? It is simply the implantation of the nature of Jesus in us. That same spirit of service, that same spirit of sacrifice, that same spirit of reaching out after the lost. And you know what the greatest offering is that we can bring to God? The greatest offering is not our financial wealth. It's not, it's not the cultured use of all our gifts and talents and abilities. The greatest offering that any of us can bring to Christ is a fellow human being, a soul in this world, led to the foot of the cross for their redemption. A broken human being that we invest our time, our energy, that we take risk on even at times for the sake of their well-being. And we don't question whether they're worthy or not. No, because we are not worthy. We don't, we don't uh, distract ourselves from the call of duty to seek and to save the lost because we, because we are concerned that they, uh, they, they brought it upon themselves or they would simply misuse the gifts or, or what's the point anyway. That's none of our business. When we see someone in need, our call, the call upon our heart, is the very call that Jesus heard that caused him to leave the throne of heaven above, to come into this world to seek and to save you and me. We need to ask God to make us colorblind, culture blind, prejudice blind. We need to ask God to see, help us to see through his eyes, to feel with his heart, to reach out with his hands, so that the world will have a testimony of a people who are different, who are countercultural. To see more broadly, to see more widely. Hey, let me ask you a question here. If you are in, the, in a circle where somebody who's on the other side of the train tracks from you, perhaps religiously, perhaps politically, they don't vote the way you do, perhaps ideologically, perhaps they have a different sexual orientation to you, whatever it might be, where they are different to you, would you defend them? Would you defend their rights? Their right to be different to you? Are you willing to be the voice of toleration, to reach out in compassion across the gulf of difference? That is the story of the Good Samaritan. That is what the kingdom of God looks like. I don't have to agree with everybody. I don't have to look like everybody else. They don't have to sound like me. They don't have to agree with me or, or, or have my religious convictions or even my moral convictions. But will I defend them when others are putting them down? You see, the thing, for the, the thing that strikes me here in the story of the Good Samaritan is that this man took an incredible risk. And sometimes when we serve others, we have to take a risk. The risk of losing something precious to us. It might be financial wealth to invest in a cause or to invest in helping somebody else. It might be reputation. It might be that people misunderstand you and think that you have taken that other person's side when actually all you're doing is defending their humanity and stopping them from being oppressed and, and, and put down because they think, see, and say things differently to others. You know, whether it's your reputation or whether it costs you friendships or whether it's a financial investment or, or whatever it might be, I want you to understand that to serve, to seek, to save often does come at a personal cost. And hey... We see it in the person of Jesus. Remember him, the one who stepped off the throne above, right? Left the comfort, the wealth of heaven, the, 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 the safety of heaven, and came down here to be used, abused, misunderstood, falsely accused, all in his effort to reach, to defend, to raise up the very ones who were abusing him. See, we live in a twisted, upside-down world. And the only way to straighten it out is to become a part of the upside down kingdom. You know, the kingdom where the values are different to this world, 
where ambition is not about self-interest, but the desire to seek, to save, and to serve. You know, where love is not the love of myself and my own, but the love of all. Where, where what it looks like to serve is not for selfish gain, but often at personal expense for the benefit and the well-being of others. I want to ask you today, what would it look like for you to be the Good Samaritan? In your cultural context, when you are online, right, and we're keyboard warriors on the other side of a Facebook debate, are you being the Good Samaritan? Are you being the, the citizen of the kingdom, displaying the kindness, the grace, and the mercy of God to those who are different to you, who are being beat up by the world around them? Especially those who you might disagree with. You see, the real test of Christianity is not how well we love those who look like us, sound like us, and who agree with us. The real test of our Christian experience, the real test of true spirituality, is how well we love those who are different, maybe even those who would count themselves as our enemies. Because you do not need to have a change of heart to love that which looks like you, but you do need a miracle of transforming grace to love that which is so completely other to you that it repulses you. You see, Jesus came here to love that which was different to him. And in the experience of loving, being loved by him, we are transformed into those who can love others. You cannot love others by going out there and trying to love others. This is a key point. You might hear the challenge, you might hear the call, you might have that conviction in your heart, and you think, well, now I need to go and try to love others better. No, you stand in the presence of God, you experience His love, you realize how different you are in your sin to what He is in His righteousness, and yet He has loved you. It is the experience of being loved that enables you to love. It is that sense of, of gratefulness that arouses in your heart, that, that sense of resurrection that comes to you, that enables you to go out. You see, you have to see and experience something different. You, you mustn't simply hear this and then go think, well, this is my duty, so, so I will do it. You don't have it within you. The only way you can love like this is to receive and be loved by the one who left the throne of heaven for your redemption. So I want to challenge you today. I want to challenge you today to be the good Samaritan, to be the citizen of the kingdom, to be the ambassador of the kingdom within your circle of influence, whether that is digitally online, whether that's in person, walking past someone on the street, whether it's in the midst of a conversation where somebody's being put down or somebody's being bullied or whatever it might be. The good Samaritan, where is your opportunity to be the hands of Jesus and the heart of Jesus in this broken world to be counter-cultural. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? Verse 37, And the lawyer answered and said, The one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, Go and do the same. Go and do the same. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, today we're troubled by a world in turmoil, are troubled by a world and experience a world and even a participate in a world where selfishness reigns. And we have to acknowledge that we haven't always been the Good Samaritan. First up, Lord, we just want to thank you and praise you because you have, you have been our Good Samaritan rescuing us. And now we ask, Lord, that you would teach us to be the same influence, the same compassion in the world around us. And we pray, Lord, that you'd help us to stop, think, and even repent in those moments where we feel so righteously indignant against someone who's different to us, especially when their moral, spiritual, religious values are different to us. Help us instead to love them, even although we may not see things the same way. Lord, may the measure of the kingdom be seen in our hearts not because we love those who are easy to love because they are like us, but because we love those who are so different to us. In Jesus' name, amen.